of, of a mixed jazz. Uno all day, every day. No, they didn't want to do like their parents did. They didn't want to go into the automotive industry. Many of them did not want to go to school to get an education. Bush them had the bomb, Gucci Khan. Raymond them had Rolls Royce. Bone Man had so-and-so. Pontiac, Southwest, downtown, Hamtramck, North End. North End a bad motherfucker. Man, we was everywhere. We was everywhere. You name it, we was pushing packs. Not since the Great Depression of the 1930s have so many people lined up for a free lunch at the Capuchin Brothers Soup Kitchen in Detroit. These are among the most desperate victims of the recession in Michigan. It began when dealers couldn't sell Detroit's cars. Auto plants closed. Thousands were laid off. If there's more jobs out there, we could get up and get off this welfare. Some people are getting out, like Pearly McPherson. She, her husband, and their three children moved here from Mississippi, but he couldn't find a job. So the other night, they loaded a trailer and moved back to Mississippi. Detroit's Renaissance Center, the towering symbol of the city's economic recovery, has been losing tenants. Shops have closed. The center has lost more than $100 million. When Coleman Young said there's the problem in Detroit is there's no more Dodge Main, everybody poo-pooed it because, you know, all the white people said it was always about race with him. But that was the most accurate thing, I think, that summarizes the situation in the city today. The easy come, easy go theory is all over with, if you're related to the automotive industry in any way right now. But when it came back in 79, one of the saddest scenes I recall seeing was the I had bought dope at Dodge Main in Hamtramck and seeing them close down what they call Dodge Main in Hamtramck and there was a black male in the uh, Detroit Free Press, they showed his picture and they, they showed a, an article saying that he had worked for Dodge for 27 years and he had he was crying, he didn't know where he was going to go. The crime rate is rising again, so is drug and alcohol abuse. 81, I had shot a guy on Cavs Cave, man, and he was testifying on me, you know what I mean? So I'm at the 10 precinct, waiting to pay my bond after my Prince clip. They bring two dope fiends in there, then the cell next to me. Damn, man, them niggas blow WW head off. I get home, my mama's standing in the door crying. You know, I say, yeah, yeah, yeah. When I get over the Cascade, everybody's standing around. Tears fall, saying I love that brother, man. I miss him. He didn't deserve that. Bruzel, my nephew, he was down with the YBIs, Young Boys Incorporated. They would do things out in broad daylight and everybody see it. You don't do anything where anybody witness you shooting down somebody. That was their downfall. Everybody knew who was doing the killer. Sure enough, they went down. Then he broke away and started his own crew, 2020 Boys. A motherfucker get his season, and it wear out for you. In Detroit, big money in the pockets of small boys has the attention of federal investigators. One of the agents uh, working under my supervision uh, started a case and ended up being the YBI Young Boys Inc. case. He ended up indicting that case along with a uh, group. Within that Young Boys Inc., they had a group called the Pony Down. They had certain little crews that were dealing dope. I, I can't really say. I suppose that when I first got to be more well-known was when I started representing a lot of those guys from the Pony Down gang, which is Leroy Buttram was supposedly the head of it. Dwayne Davis's old crew was spared the indictment, probably due to Davis's death. If Wayne hadn't got killed, we possibly would have got indicted. The New York Times reported today that authorities are trying to crack drug rings, paying the boys thousands of dollars to work as runners, distributing heroin to addicts. One 11-year-old was arrested with $2,000 in his pockets. And one auto dealer said a 15-year-old bought a Mercedes-Benz recently. I believe what happened, and I don't know, because I wasn't working for the government, but I think with respect to YBI and Pony Down, I think it, it got to a point where not enough of these guys were going to jail. We were winning... I mean, Otis Culpepper was representing the, the YBI guys, and it, it, he was winning. Anytime they'd get it, they thought was a good case, and state court would win. Same thing here. They'd bring a homicide charge, I'd win. You can't talk about all those other Chamber brothers or nobody. YBI is the organization that made selling drugs, made it hip, and made killing people okay. 1985, Sturdivant Street near Dexter Avenue. Ray Peoples, recently paroled from federal prison and already having survived being shot on East Philadelphia and Monica in Puritan, is killed while sitting in a car. 
YBI will never stop to the casket drop. You know what I'm saying? Because there's always a motherfucker trying to emulate us. And that's the aftermath of what these niggas out here doing now. And a motherfucker can't tell you no different. He's an offspring. Whether I done stuck my dick in his mammy or not, he's one of my sons. Because you're doing shit I used to do. And you're trying real hard at it, but it can never, ever be done again. No arrest is ever made in the murder of Raymond Peoples, and the YBI era comes to an end with Butch Jones in prison and Ray Peoples joining Dwayne Davis in death. But Detroit had been changed forever. YBI was it, and it hit. Mid-83, that's when crack became aware of around the east side of Detroit. Cocaine had become an acceptable drug, but the, the, the explosion, the real explosion, occurred when crack cocaine, and they called it free base, whatever they wanted to call it. Because that was, A, it was, it was destroy, just destroyed people. I mean, just destroyed them. It was free base. So you had to have money to get high. Wasn't no motherfucker bamming on your door with $5. But no, this nigga came in on the free base and spent 150 and, and, and blew his brains off, heard them bells. You know what I'm saying? Like Nita Ward said, ring my motherfucking bell. Young dealers can make up to $800 a day, possess an arsenal of weapons, and readily kill to protect their turf and profits. The smallest confrontation can become a matter of life and death. Whenever police raid a crack house, they say they're also bound to find some heavy firepower. Drugs and guns are a deadly mixture, and together they've given Detroit the highest murder rate of any American city. This is a war. This is an epidemic. I've, I've been to Vietnam, but this is a war right here. This is our Vietnam. Where the cocaine, the cocaine was dead, but it just really got real popular. This summer has been especially violent, with more than 500 shootings reported in two months. FBI figures show Detroit with 61 murders for every 100,000 citizens last year. Gary, Indiana was second, and other major cities ran far behind. It didn't get really wild until 84, 85, and 86. Detroit police say they see this less as a crime problem than as a drug problem. Thousands of people, jobless and hopeless, look for a way out and find trouble instead. In the aftermath of the YBI and Pony Down indictments, the hundreds of young workers they'd employed graduated to running their own operations, many of them taking their show on the road, and dealers from Detroit started getting arrested all around the country. The little 40000 we make here a day, we can go out of town and make 80000 Man, we was going to St. Louis, man, Alabama, Cleveland, knocking their heads off. Well, yeah, well, it was easy to go out of town and get it because of the mannerism and the way we was brought up here. As opposed to going out of town, them guys ain't got nothing. They slow. And we go down there and tear their heads up and come home and spend the wealth. Flint, Michigan is a short ride up the I-75 freeway from Detroit and the center of General Motors car production. You know, we took that YBI thing straight to Flint because they ain't know no better because we were still using a lot of them old stamps that they left. Them guys was going to work, man. We just had to wait till Friday to really, really roll up there. You know what I'm saying? Because they worked all week and got hot in the motherfucker on the weekend. But, man, after we stayed in that motherfucker for three months, motherfucker started quitting, getting fired Wait. from the plants. Man, and then this shit, this shit just turned into an epidemic where motherfuckers was getting money every day. 85% of them was from the plant. Them suck ass motherfuckers ready for the world. We used to sit up in a hotel room with them suckers and, and sell them the dope. And we'll say, oh, oh, Sheila, let me love you till the money comes. Man, you know what I'm saying? Them bitches was smoked out. Uh, Toledo was the, was the first stop. Then we went down to Lima, then we spread it out even farther. We pulled right on in and started doing business, break it off, and so forth. In every state across the United States, man, you got a set of Detroit guys set up in their town. You understand what I'm saying? And I learned this from being in the Fed joint in every state, man. I, I got 188 months. I did 10 years, man, for them suckers, man. The Young Boys Inc. and those that followed after didn't make the streets fill up with drugs. They were just there at the right time to profit off the average citizen's desire to get high. And that's why no sooner than the police sent a so-called kingpin off to prison, another rose up to take his place. Beatrice Holloway walked in my office in 19, I want to say 85. He walked in, I was still in the Lafayette building, he said he had a Fed case, felon in possession. And he just got out of jail, out of prison. He came in and he said, look, I, I, I'm going to try this case, I've got a defense, which he did. I don't have any money, hardly, you know, I've got, I mean, some 500 bucks, whatever it was he had. 
but my word's good. He says, I'll, I'll, you tell me the fee. It'll take me some time, but I'm gonna pay, I'll pay the fee. And he was, at the time, literally had just gotten out of jail on federal parole. And there was something about the guy I thought he was telling the truth. And it was, and it was a tribal case, and I'm a sucker for trials. And I said, okay, we got a deal. And we tried the case, and he was found not guilty. Demetrius Holloway, had he wanted to be, could have been a CEO of a, a major corporation. He never drank, he never smoked, he laughed at people who used drugs. He was smart as hell, and he was cunning, and he was a leader. He was a big, big whale, is what the cops used to call him. Demetrius Holloway and, and, and Rick Carter, even though they were friends, were as different as two human beings could ever be. Anybody in the streets will tell you this. Soon after getting out of prison, Boone crossed paths with Maserati Rick in an East Side pizza parlor. After one of Rick's underlings started an argument with him, Boone flashed his gun, and Maserati stepped in to defuse the situation. He said, man, did this, man. We could work together if you just give me time to speak with you. We went and got into his bins. We talked, he, he was telling me about himself, about what he do and so forth. He said, you might have heard me, they called me Maserati. Rick was cheap and petty. I mean, he was all right to deal with, but he, he, he was... He wasn't all right to do. He was a pain in the ass, is what he was. And uh, he liked to flaunt stuff, you know, and walk around like he was a big shot, which, I, in a sense, he was, I guess. But I want to know what you'd be willing to be my bodyguard. I said, how much you talking? He said, man, I'll give you a couple thousand dollars. Just hang with me. Make sure nobody, you know, do anything to me. Thought about it. And I said, OK, cool, but when am I supposed to get this money? He pulled out $2,000 and gave it to me. Pistol case outside the, the uh, skating rink over there on the east side, because he was an east side guy. He owed me money. I won the case, and that's why I say it was cheap. It was, a, I mean, it was a pistol case. He probably owed like three grand or something like that. And the damn guy would not pay. And it was always, I'll see you next week. So I typed up a motion to withdraw. He had another case pending. And I typed up a motion to withdraw, and I called the guy in that was from the east side. I said, take this thing. I wasn't filing it. Tape this thing to the walls and the windows, like at the bars, everywhere on the east side, so people can see what a cheapskate Rick is. And, and the guy went out, and about two days later, man, what are you doing? I said, well, shit, you gonna come in and bring me the money? And they brought me a leather coat instead. I had just got out of prison. So I had a lot of anger and tension in me. I was trying to find some way to release it. The best way to release it without going back to prison and so forth was tough man contest. So I went and fought in that. Cobo Hall. Bruiser brought some of his friends down there, which uh, was the Brown Brothers. Best friends. An ironic name for what the FBI once called the most murderous drug ring in United States history. I didn't really know much of anything about the best friends other than that they were supposed to be a bunch of killers on the east side. But I didn't know they were called the best friends. I just knew they were some evil looking guys. When the fight was over and I stepped out of the ring to go back to the back, uh, Bruiser stepped up and told me that uh, Reggie wanted to meet you, Rockin' Ridge. They approached me like, damn, man, we also hear that uh, you're supposed to be working with Maserati Rick. Suspected of 80-plus murders across multiple states, best friends started on Detroit's east side as a murder-for-hire ring run by the four Brown brothers. I did things for people, for Bruiser, before I met them. By 1985, the Brown brothers were doing hits on the east side for various dealers. We Rick boy, as long as he got the money, was anybody boys, as long as you got the money to pay us. You ain't got the money to pay us, we, 